Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of the Universe Within podcast. This episode of the show is being sponsored by the Amazonian Plan Healing Center, the Temple of the Way of Light. I've worked at the temple, I believe, for the past decade now, and I can really attest to the quality of the work that they do. Uh, predominantly, they're working with the plant medicine ayahuasca, uh, working in the Shipibo lineage. The Shipibo are a group of people who have a very long history of working uh, with not only ayahuasca, but just a, a pharmacopoeia of plants in general. And at the temple, they run 12-day workshops. In those 12 workshops, there's six ceremonies. They work with four different doctors or healers, cuarenderos, um, two to three facilitators. There's uh, just a really amazing support staff, uh, yoga teachers, vegetalistas or herbalists, um, massage people, bone doctors, uh, an amazing integration team, a preparatory team. So really just an amazing place to, to go really deeply into this work and to get whatever it is that one is looking for, whether that's healing of some sorts, um, introspection, knowledge, uh, deepening one's place in this world, whatever that is, uh, they create a really amazing environment to do that. Unfortunately, they've been closed since March of 2020 due to the pandemic, but they're scheduled to reopen in, I believe, August of this year. So if you'd like more information, you can check out their website at templeofthewayoflight.org. Also, myself and my colleague, Marav Artsy, who I interviewed in one of the early episodes, I believe it was episode 28, um, we're continuing to run plant dietas. Uh, the next one will be running in this episode probably will already be out uh, by then, but it's in July in New York in the U.S. Um, and then we'll be back to the Sacred Valley of Peru, running another dieta in uh, September. And then also in October, we'll most likely be in Egypt running some diets. And the dieta is a really amazing opportunity to, to go into a period of, of fasting, of isolation, of working with one particular plant to really go deeply into that process of learning and healing. Um, we work in the, the tradition we were trained in, uh, predominantly working with tobacco and trees, and then bringing in a lot of different modalities that, that each of us bring to the table as well. So if you'd like more information on that, you can check out my website at nicotianarustica.org and also Marav's site at tobaccodiets.com. My guests for today's show are my friend Diana, who I interviewed a few episodes ago, uh, and her colleague, Dr. Ido Cohen. And um, it was a really beautiful conversation. Uh, they, they both shared really beautifully. Uh, I think they have a lot of knowledge, a lot of depth, a lot of wisdom to share. They do a lot of work with plant medicines and integration. Um, they hold an integration circle. They, they do a lot of um, kind of work that they've, they've done on themselves. And then they've studied with a lot of people. And they have this, I think, really beautiful... Uh, way to integrate that work. Things like um, psychology, uh, Jungian archetypes, the work of uh, Dr. Gabor Mate. They've um, both spent time in the Amazon and uh, Diana's worked at uh, the, the same place I have for a number of years. So uh, they're really beautiful people. And I, I think this uh, this podcast interview was, was really beautiful. And I, I think and hope you guys will get a lot out of it. Um, as always, if you're able to support the podcast, that's a really big help to me to continue to bring on these guests. It, it takes a, a bit of work to, to do all the coordination and interviewing and editing and publishing and everything. So that's a really big help to me. Um, to all of the people who have done that, thank you very much. Um, uh, a really beautiful way of doing that is via Patreon. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up and there's different tiers and they give you different things back. Things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&As. Um, to all the people who have done that, thank you very much. Uh, the patrons, as they're called. Um, there's also the option of direct donating via PayPal. I'll put a link to that in the show notes. If you're not able to do that, um, supporting the show through simply subscribing is really a big help. So going on the YouTube channel, subscribing to the show, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help with the algorithms. And then with the audio version, going on Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the show, and uh, leaving a, a starred rating and a short review, that's also a really big help. So I think that's it. And without further ado, here is my conversation with Diana and Ido. I'm running out from the maze. Running out from the maze, running out of the maze today. Running out from the maze, running out 
from the maze I'm running up from the maze today I'm running up from the maze Running up from the maze Run out of the maze today All right. Well, welcome. Well, I'm here uh, with my friend Deanna Rogers and uh, Ido Cohen, Dr. Ido Cohen. Um, I did an interview with Deanna a few weeks ago. So if anyone uh, would like to learn more about Deanna, I think we talked for two or three hours. So there's a lot of info there. Um, but Deanna actually recommended, uh, well, I'm not sure if you recommended or someone else recommended that I interview you two, um, but we ended up bringing it all together. So I have both of you on. Someone on your, yeah. Ah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. He was a former guest of ours, Sorry. and he, he <laughs> wanted to see you two speak. So, <laughs> so we're we're making it happen. Um, so maybe to start, uh, can you all just uh, both give a little bit of uh, background of of who you are? where you're coming from and, and how you got interested in this work and then also how both of you ended up collaborating together. Um, maybe we can start with Diana and then move on to, to Ido. Sure, I'll, I'll give a shorter version then. <laughs> I guess the longer version is in the other podcast so I'll be a little bit shorter today, but um, yeah, I guess I've been sitting with it since our last interview. Um, there's definitely, this theme throughout my life around community and people and taking care of each other. Um, that feels like just kind of central to, to who I am. And the way I found myself into this world of plant medicines um, was very, was very organic in a lot of ways. Um, so I put the intention out there in terms of wanting a more authentic spiritual practice and Ayahuasca showed up not too long after that, and and that was over ten years ago. And so it's been, um, yeah, it's been a, <laughs> a whole wide range of of experiences and thoughts and feelings about this path and what it means and how it shifts and changes. And I guess uh, I met Jason at the temple in two thousand and thirteen, and so I worked there for about four years and then I've been doing integration work back in Canada now for the last four years. And so um, I guess I've seen all of the stages, the kind of preparation, the integration, the during, um, and have a, a reverence, I think, for all of those different stages of the experience. And so I think that kind of has kept me curious enough to stay on this path and um, to learn tools and also just to get to know myself better in terms of, um, yeah, I, I see this as a path uh, of getting to know yourself and who you are and what's important. Um, so I'd say that's, that's kind of what brought me here. There's more about that in the last one. So I think I'll keep it a little bit shorter today. Yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, Ido. Um, yeah, Jason, thank you for yeah, thank you for inviting us and inviting me. Um, I where do I start? Uh, I'm I live in the Bay Area. I'm clinically trained psychologist. I went to CIIS, the California Institute of Integral Studies. Um, yeah, and I see people. I have a private practice here, and I see people both for stuff like early childhood trauma, mostly uh, early childhood emotional trauma, like neglect, um, intense like criticism, um, rejection, you know, depression, relational issues. And in when I came, how I got to this work, well, I also see people for preparation and integration. That's a big part of my practice. Um, and the reason I got to it is um, when I came to the Bay, I was introduced to the world of plants and ayahuasca in specific. And um, it's something that I've always been curious about. And stepping into that world was feeling like uh, both um, deep validation of what I knew is real and it's true and it's somewhere out there. This world that's beyond words, that's beyond 
that's beyond the veil that can allow us to go so deep into ourselves and so far outside of ourselves. And when it was time for me to do my doctoral dissertation, I was like, okay, what's the one experience that I've been so curious about? And it was, how do you take big experiences like that and create long-term sustainable change? Because that was my curiosity since um, I went to, the, to India when I was in my 20s and saw, went through a huge transformation and um, saw my friends go through a huge transformation. And, um, then we all came back and all that change started kind of falling apart and I couldn't reconcile that. I couldn't reconcile that paradox. I was like, if you experience something so precious, why would it go away? So for me, this was the opportunity because for me, ayahuasca world is the world that activates your somatic self, your psychological, your emotional, your spiritual self. So everything comes alive. And how do you take that and create that long-term sustainable change? And um, yeah, spent six years researching it, went to Peru for a, while, for a little bit to do personal research and, and study research um, and started the integration circle, which is a community of people we collaborate to help to create workshops and one-on-ones for people to prepare and integrate uh, psychedelic or antigenic states. Um, Dan and I literally just came off a conversation where we ended another six months project that we did, which was a consultation group for therapists, nurses, facilitators who are interested in this kind of work. And I made Diana in psychedelic science in 2016, okay. something with Tanya. Back then it was Tanya Mate, she's now Tanya Kumanan, but um, I, Tanya invited me to do uh, to be on an integration panel with her and Diana, and I think that's where we first connected. And slowly we started kind of connecting. We did a workshop in Vancouver together through a mutual friend, Jenny. And then when the pandemic hit, <laughs> um, I think our collaboration just really came alive. And we've done a lot of beautiful projects in the last year and a half. Um, Anything from art, in, doing monthly integration circles, first and foremost, which is a big part of what we do, anger workshops, how to work with anger, how to work with the critic. And then we did the archetype workshop. That was um, very profound and very meaningful, uh, which we'll probably talk more about. So yeah, I think maybe that's, that's enough about me. Yeah, great. <clears throat> um, so uh, I would imagine most people listening to this podcast um, have worked with plants, they, they worked with ayahuasca, maybe other plants. Um, but if, if people are watching and they haven't, why, from, from both of your perspectives, why would someone be interested in, in working with plant medicine? Um, probably more and more people are familiar with these things. It, it's become more in their kind of scope or, or their worldview. There's little iterations or things that pop up and there's maybe a curiosity, but what would you say would be kind of like a, a, a reason that, that someone would actually want to venture into this world, which still is very foreign for many people? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a really good question. And I think there's a lot of, a lot of different answers that could come forward with that, with that question. Um, I think some of the few things that pop up for me immediately is like, uh, there's a piece around culture, there's a piece around like our healthcare system, there's a piece around just like a longing. Um, and so I think kind of the places where they intersect, I think, yeah, and um, we talked a little bit about this, but there is this whole kind of new wave happening of psychedelic therapies in the in the west and then there's a huge i'd say interest in plant medicines that are more rooted in and kind of indigenous traditions and i think it's because people are are at this place where they're um yeah they're wanting something more it's like either the healthcare system isn't giving them what they need in order to treat like depression or anxiety or you know a lot of the the allopathic treatments while sometimes they're really effective and important 
um, often don't kind of address the root of what's happening for a person. And so I think there's some kind of like curiosity of, well, there has to be something else or <laughs> this, I'm not actually getting well, I'm just kind of managing my symptoms. Um, and so I think there's kind of this, with the rise of these conditions like depression and anxiety, um, there's more and more need for something to address kind of what's, what's below them. And then I think that kind of speaks to the cultural piece in terms of the Western culture, I think is really built on the premise of disconnection. And so it's about how do you disconnect from your food source? How do you disconnect from your energy source? How do you disconnect from yourself? Um, there isn't a, a lot of ritual. There isn't a lot of spirituality built into that. I think a lot of people are rejecting kind of more organized religions, but I also think that that's a part of, of being human is that you have that deeper curiosity, that you're longing for that connection, that you're longing for that belonging, that I think a more spiritual practice will give to you. And not even saying that everyone needs to have a spiritual practice after doing psychedelics. I think it often happens. Um, but there's just kind of a like a longing that I think culturally people are saying, well, there's got to be something more than this and a kind of sickness of, of this culture in terms of, yeah, I think it's not, it's one that I think you have to be born in, into a very specific environment within it that really nurtures kind of who you are and your essence. And there's a lot of, um, I think, oppression that has to come through uh, growing up in the West. And so I think this is a, a tool for yeah, coming back to some of those things that are important or your essence or coming back to yourself. Again, this kind of um, personal exploration that often ends up in a, in a relational, uh, I don't know how to say that, in, in some form of relational being. So being related to your place, being related to people, finding that community, finding uh, other folks that are there to support you, supporting others, being of service. So these types of things that often come, not always, but can come from this work. So I think it's, um, so I guess the, to summarize that, <laughs> there's some, some conditions that aren't being met by kind of Western medical thing. And I think that they really come from a cultural context that's, that's not so healthy. And so I feel like it's, it's a, a real need to address kind of some of these deeper elements and for people to to like actualize or get to know themselves in that in that deeper way. Yeah, great. Yeah, beautifully said, man. Um, I guess I don't know why, but I'm gonna say I, I think I want to caution that you know this plants or psychedelics are not necessarily for everyone. So I don't want to Make it sound that we're like saying here we found a new cure for everything and um yeah i think it's about feeling called feeling curious you know doing some research really kind of getting in in a relationship with that world and seeing if it calls you um and if it doesn't that's totally fine there's no problem with that um yeah i think i mean i agree with everything diana said you know, um I think our, our concept of healing is expanding. I think collectively what we understand, we're, we're reconnecting with what we knew in the past of what's capable as far as healing, right? We live in a, the medical model is about, mostly about symptom reduction or extracting the problem. It's not a holistic view of, well, what did the, how did that problem impact you emotionally, um, psychologically, spiritually? And I think people are starting, a lot of people are starting to create more of that level of relationship with themselves, like really wanting to understand, like, why am I just walking through life in the kind of okayness kind of way or in a survival kind of way? And they want to connect with something, you know, call it soulful, sacred, deep, spiritual, everyone finds their own divine, godly, whatever word works for you. Um, so I think there is a search for, for connection with self and also with connection with outside of ourselves. I think a lot of people want to connect better with other people 
and I want to understand why they're having a hard time connecting with other people in a really deep, intimate, vulnerable way. And also want to understand why they don't connect with, yeah, things like the things that capitalism makes us disconnect from nature and experiencing joy in the moment and experiencing peace and finding fulfillment, even if you're not accomplishing a thousand things at the same time, um, even if you're just sitting outside and listening to birds or experiencing a really precious moment with your loved one or your child or your pet or whatever that is. Um, so I think a lot of it comes from people are craving a different sense of relationship. I think we're, you know, we're always relating to something. And yet our, our relationships are so lacking. They're, they're, they're not as whole, they're not as full, they're not as fulfilling, they're not as love-filled as they can be. And I think more and more people see that. And it's not enough to just take care of the symptom anymore. We have to go a little bit deeper. And because that's when the right, not to foreshadow maybe the rest of the conversation, but that's where the wholeness piece kicks in. If you take care of just the symptom, you're gonna come back to it eventually because the problem remains. So you're not really building a sense of wholeness. You're just building a sense of okayness. So I think a lot of people are really waking up to that and you know, sadly, Diana and I talk a lot about that. I think people are more aware of their, um, more and more people come to this work because they feel like a limit, like an edge of suffering that they can't tolerate. So there is almost this um, sense of, um, yeah, let's just leave it with suffering. They're like, okay, something is definitely wrong. Something is definitely not working well, and I want to change that. And I don't want to just do it with psychiatric pills or try another form of another yoga class or another form of therapy or I want something more. I want something more. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Hmm. It's interesting because we're, we're all probably more or less around the same age. I don't want to make any, any assumptions, but, um, you know, when I was growing up, uh, it was it was very much in this time of like uh, I grew up in the U.S. and I remember seeing these commercials of like don't do drugs because this is your brain and then someone cracks an egg in a in a in a frying pan and it starts sizzling and so I think so many people from from our generation from older generations it, it's a very deeply ingrained thing that the drugs are bad. And yet the vast majority of people in, as you all said, the Western world are on a number of drugs. I mean, I think in the US, the, the average person over, I think, you know, and anyone feel free to, to fact check me if I'm wrong, but, but I think it's something like people who are over 40 are on average of like four to five prescription medications, which is a tremendous amount. Um, and so it also seems like there's this real kind of disconnect between what is a drug, <clears throat> what are plants. Uh, I think a lot of people, I mean, it was interesting. I was having a conversation with someone the other day about tobacco, and they asked me if it was a plant. <laughs> and it, it didn't surprise me because it's, you know, as you were saying, Diana, there is this disconnect and, and a lot of these things that, that we just kind of take for granted, we are very disconnected to. And so I think when a lot of people think about plants, I mean, they also don't think that even most pharmaceutical medicine is for the majority plant derived. It's some sort of, of, of isolated alkaloid. But when, when you all are, are speaking of plant medicines, usually it's referring to something a, a bit different from what people may think. Uh, you know, we're not necessarily talking about like drinking chamomile tea or putting basil on our, on our food, which, you know, also is plant medicine. But you, you mentioned these, these words like ayahuasca, or maybe people are familiar with other plant medicines, but uh, they're often taken in, in a ritualistic or ceremonial context. So how would you all describe, I guess, that, that term plant medicine, what it's referring to? 
and then how these things are actually helping us because you you pointed to a lot of different things like a sense of community a sense of connection uh, uh, working on these these ailments which perhaps are, are more western model has failed us things like mental ailments depression anxiety uh, lack of purpose lack of connection so if people aren't familiar, how is how is working with one of these plants going to solve these seemingly very, <laughs> very large and complex problems? You know, you want to start this one? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, it's interesting. You know, I was just actually thinking about um, someone that's close to me came back from Peru and kept using the term the medicine, the medicine, the medicine, and it triggered that conversation for me. And I'm, the end I can really validate or invalidate, but I know that that word exists like in the Shipibo tradition, they use the word medicine, but I don't know if they use it the same way that we in the West use medicine. I don't know if they use it in the same way as like, oh, you know, this is something you, uh, you go to fix an ailment for, as opposed to you're interacting with this entity that has the capacity to heal you. So it's not the same as taking a pill. It's not the same medicine. It's not the same concept of medicine. Um, yeah, I think <laughs> plant medicine is the way I understand it. It's about entering a space where you get the opportunity to both observe, learn, learn and see where there is this harmony, trauma, um, disconnect and even fragmentation of, of yourself and of your relationship between yourself and something else. So the medicinal part of it for me is more about it opens you up. It really like takes away all these layers that prevent you from seeing, from feeling, from sensing, from intuiting your, this deep, the, your deeper sense of self, your deeper sense of, of beingness, of, you, of being a human, and what it means to be a full human. So it's medicinal in the sense that it opens you, it shows you, it helps you open. It's not going to do the work for you. It's not going to do the, the thing that, you know, um, yeah, the psychiatric pills do for you or what we hope for, like chamomile too, it will do for you, right? It will give you some of that, but it's not going to resolve the problem for you. I think a lot of us, a lot of Westerners go to that, to this, to these practices with this hope that it's with this and i'm not, not in a judgmental way i think it's just part of our western problem we go with this childlike attitude of i'm going to be healed i'm just going to be a recipient right just like a child that's going to their mother or their father i'm having an experience i'm going to them because they're going to give me something i don't have that's going to help me feel better about myself it's very one-dimensional in that way so for me, when we say plant medicine, it's about actually entering a very, very rich and full relationship of like, no, it's a give and take. It's a learning and it's a learning and a doing. I'm going to be experiencing these things and then I'm going to have to go back into the world and do this thing. That's the medicine. It shows me the path. It shows me the problem or it can. It can also show me the potential. It can also show me how to, how to work with those elements, how to create those things. That's the medicinal part of it, for me at least. Yeah, great. <clears throat> um, I guess I'm just thinking about my time at the temple and Jason, I'm sure you could also speak to this. I guess I also just wanna, you know, people come there generally with expectations and generally it's a long list of expectations about how this will work or not work. And I guess I just have seen it work so differently with so many people. And I think there's a, a quality of meeting people where they're at and also to what their system can handle. And there's no judgment in that at all. So sometimes it's a very subtle experience for people. And sometimes it's completely disconnected from reality and, um, and then a whole spectrum in between of what that can look like. And so I guess how these plant medicines work, yeah, similarly to what Ido expressed, like this idea of both like learning and healing being the same path. 
Um, so having access to other parts of ourselves, to having access to um, opening up these, these things that have been shut down or disconnected from over time for a good reason. It's like, that's what we had to do in order to survive or to protect ourselves, or um, there can be a whole list of, of why people have shut down or, or haven't had the safe space to feel their feelings or the patterns they learned as a child and the list can go on and on. And so I guess these medicines really kind of work to open us up and connect us back with what's been there, what's been forgotten or what's been pushed away or what we've had to do in order to survive. Um, and I feel like it really looks so different for each person in terms of what that path will be. And ultimately, I think it's like helping us get into those deeper elements of what's there. I feel like sometimes it's really hard in a conscious way if you've had really elaborate complexes or defenses or personality structures that are there to protect something that might feel quite vulnerable. Um, sometimes those things can be really hard to access because your body is saying this isn't safe to go there. And so sometimes these medicines like when used within the right setting and I also really echo Edo that they're not for everyone um, can help us kind of get into some of that deeper stuff and then also I think at some point help connect us with with something larger so and that that spiritual dimension or that connection with something larger i feel like that's such a um a forgotten element of of health and well-being in the west it's like okay in every if you go back to every indigenous culture um, even in in europe there's some connection about this idea again of being in relationship to where you are and your practices and um, offerings. And it's generally quite elaborate or rituals to move through this part of life or this process. And um, so I really think that in a way, you know, not to that same extent, but it can kind of bring us back into relationship. And I think that can be really, really healing. And I remember um, talking with a mutual friend of Jason and I, Publio, I remember I was actually talking with him and his dad one day and his dad was saying, you know, if you ever feel really stuck, like he was just talking in general, but he was like saying like his advice for people, if they're ever feeling really stuck is to be in service. And I think there's something about that. Like, I think there is an innate part of people where they want to be in connection and in relationship um, to people. And, you know, I may have a different idea of what that looks like than others, but I think there is some part of our, our being. So I, I think that that's once again, the, what this kind of plant medicine can do. And again, it can be very, very physical for a long period of time, because maybe that's where the healing needs to happen. And maybe someone has been disembodied for a long period of time for a really good reason. And so I just want to say that it, it also can take a long time I think that there can be these miraculous experiences, but I guess I often see those when people have had some form of foundation to kind of build off of. I think there needs to be some kind of um, structure there, internal structure to also support this work as well. So I think that um, I remember in a talk, Gabor Mate was speaking about like, healing PTSD is never going to just be a therapy or even a psychedelic. It might be painting and dancing and all of these different practices. And so I, I guess I just really, that has always stuck out to me. Like it's not going to be a, a one magic cure all, which I think is kind of the, what Ido is speaking. There's this kind of like desire for people to just feel better and to get this extract this thing out of them. And sometimes that may happen, but generally there has to be some kind of learning that happens in that process as well. And I think that plant medicines can give us that access to the deeper element of how did this happen in the first place of, okay, oh, I'm a really anxious person. Oh, okay, get curious about that. Well, how did that, how did that start to take form? That's been a, a seed growing inside of me for a long time. How do I start to get back to that seed? And, and you know, if you, even if you think about weeding a garden, um, if you just pull it out at the top, then it's just going to come back. 
again and again. And so it's about, yeah, how do you start to go in and really care for and tend to those roots with a lot of sensitivity and a lot of care. So that's what comes up for me. Yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> Tiana, you mentioned this idea that, that you've been involved in kind of all of these different aspects of the work from the preparation stage to the, the, the actualization stage, the, the, I guess you could say ceremonial stage, and then to the, 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 the post ceremony stage, the integration. Um, can, can you both speak a little bit <clears throat> about that? Um, I mean, e I guess even breaking it down into three stages is a little um, limiting in a way too, but, but I think those three stages are super important. Um, can you speak to why those are important and, and what function all of those serve? Because I, I think a lot of people, and, and obviously it's changing, but you both spoke of this idea that we often have this idea that that I just do something, whether it's taking a pill or drinking this cup, and then my problems go away. But you're alluding to something that there's actually, there's a preparatory stage just before we even get to that point. And then there's that that experience we go through. But then there's also something after that as well. Yeah. Um, I, I guess that I, I think this is one place where the psychedelic community, and I know that they, some like MAPS training, for example, are integrating this already. Um, but I think that this is one thing, that movement that's kind of happening in the West can really learn from indigenous traditions in terms of what it is to even think about preparing yourself for these experiences and the value of that and the learning that comes. And for me, the the preparation is a lot about listening. Um, I think that's the key of listening, of staying curious of, you know, I've seen the experience so many times where people have said like, okay, they sign up, they put their payment down for a dieta or a retreat or a, an experience. And then all of a sudden all this, this shit comes up for them and they're like what's happening what's going on I'm not there yet um, and I, I think that's so beautiful it's like okay how do you start to listen like what's wanting your attention because maybe sometimes folks will have a certain idea this is what I wanted to this is what I wanted to do my journey on and but all of this information is coming up well I'm like well you should probably pay attention to what's coming up um, and get curious about that and I mean I think there's also that kind of that physical preparation of cleaning your body um, of it's kind of like setting the stage it's like you're you're going in and you're setting the stage of okay here we're preparing we're making the props we're getting our system clean and prepared um, and I think within that you know even uh, I used to do group prep calls for the, the temple when they were running and uh, people would always talk about but coffee or <laughs> this one thing that they were having a really hard time giving up like salt like and they'd be like well how do I make my food taste good and like that was like a really common question and I'm like okay well what's coming up for you when you think about like giving up coffee what's coming up for you when you're like, oh, my food is really bland and boring and I'm missing salt. And it's like all of these ways in which we prepare can be a little kind of trail into something that's, that's there for us. And so I think this is, I think one of the amazing parts about this, how the should people kind of run their, their system is that really starting to reduce that input. So if it's on a media level, if it's on a a social level, it's, if it's on a sexual level in terms of sexual energy or food energy, um, it starts to trigger things for people. And so I think it's really good because you can also start to work with those little ways as they come up, which can be a really good training for the, the actual experience. And often, you know, um, people will start to have dreams coming up with certain themes. Um, when they say yes. And so for me, it's really about this observational listening, paying attention uh, and really a, a place to kind of root that curiosity. Um, so maybe I guess that's the prep stage. Ido, do you want to add anything on that stage? 
Or do you want to talk I, about that? Yeah, no, I love what you said. You know, I, I was just, I think about it as noticing or noticing and being honest with yourself about what's actually a life. Right. So we come with this, I can come with this idea of like, oh, I want to work on this thing or that thing. Well, like you said, all of a sudden, this other, th this other trauma, this other desire comes up. I'm like, wait, that's totally outside of the plan of what I wanted to work on. But it, that's where, so that's why I name it's like, what is actually alive? What comes alive for you? Because I think the moment you make, like you said, you put that deposit down or you make that decision, ceremony starts. Ceremony doesn't start when you sit. For me, the ceremony, the interaction with the plants, the interaction with that space starts when you make that decision inside, okay, I'm going to go do this. All of a sudden, something wakes up. Like, why is it all of a sudden? Then I start having dreams or intuitions or all of a sudden memories start to come, like, flooding or coming to, like, to mind and things that I haven't thought about in years. I mean, right? If we think about it from a place where there's nothing random and there's just either the conscious or unconscious it's like okay something in my unconscious is being stirred up and it's coming forward in response to something in reaction to something so and i think a lot of the times it can be um yeah it can be a little hard because we want to control we want to curate the experience but i want to experience this it's like yeah but some deeper part of you is saying no actually maybe you need to look at that and I love what you said as far as like, yeah, what happens to you when you're, I think about a lot about when you go through a diet, people start having a relationship with restriction. You can't eat this, you can't have sex, you can't smoke, you can, you know, do all these things, you want to avoid it. All of a sudden, I heard so many people say like, I don't like restrictions. This is bringing up stuff for me. Great. What is it about for you and restrictions? What relationship does it remind you of? What kind of states of being from your history does this bring you up? Because that's maybe what's actually alive for you. Or you can already start doing some work about that. As opposed to seeing like, oh, there's, uh, yeah, it's opposed to like just brushing it aside and again, trying to go with what I think it should have. And there's something that I always bring that, you know, Deanna, this is something I learned from you and Tanya, which is like, you know, we have, I think a lot in the preparation when we start to come into terms of what I actually want to work on, there's an element of shame. Because I think there's stuff that I'm willing to communicate and then there is maybe something I want to work on that I'm not going to be willing to communicate because just saying it out loud feels so shame. So I can say like, yeah, you know, I want to work out on my anxiety and I'm like this and that, but maybe underneath it, you know, I'm really anxious because I am terrified of people. Or really, or there is this deeper thing that just saying it makes it more real, which makes me more scared. And if I'll tell it to you, that makes me more embarrassed. So I think there is something, if you really do like mindful preparation, it's, uh, yeah, there is really opportunity to, first of all, just, just in the preparation work to kind of already start doing deep work. Like, okay, what is it like to be vulnerable with someone? If I go and share my deeper intention with a friend or with a facilitator, someone like Vienna or with my integration therapist or my therapist or whoever that is, or the shaman or facilitator of the retreat, and I go and tell them. So it already can bring up, I think, so, many, so much opportunity for us to look at where there is aliveness, where there is tenderness, where there is vulnerability, and where there is like shame or fear about acknowledging what's real and what's which is such a beautiful, it's so, so rich, it's such a gift that you already get all these things before you even set, set foot in the actual experience. So I'm not saying you should bring all of that, you know, and flood yourself, but it's like stuff you can know. And you're like, oh, you know, these, all these like little gems that I'm already collecting. So that's as far as prep. I'm just going to start with, the, and we can rip off from there. And Jason, yeah. And, and one thing I do want to, you know, I took uh, courses with Francoise Borzat, who is a very known teacher in the Bay, and I think by now uh, anywhere, teaches psychedelic therapy, and um, a woman named Susanna Bustos, and something that I really took from them is that integration is all of it. Integration is not just what happens after, it's how you prepare impacts how you enter the space, which impacts what happens after. 
So we need to divide them because it's, it's good for us to divide so we can work with them more consciously, but to think about them as also one heart, one thing, of one experience. So that feels important. Um, and as far as the actual experience, oh, there's so much we can say. Um, the things that feel really important is first really establishing tools of navigation. Right? What's, what are the things that I can reach for that if something gets overwhelming, overwhelmingly ecstatic or overwhelmingly fear, like frightening, what is the things that I can try and bring back to kind of help me stay, um, stay conscious as much as I can? So there's some part of me that's still kind of, even if I'm all over the place and I'm, you know, torn between heaven and hell or whatever that is, there's a part of me that's like observing and it's still online because I think it's, and again, we can't control it, but things become, I think things become really tricky when we are totally dissociated, when the experience really just rips us apart. And again, it's uncontrollable, but can I start in, if I'm going to do this experience, can I already start, okay, maybe I need to take some breath, like a breath tool, like how can I come back to my breath? How can I work with my body? Like move my body, touch my body, remember that I have a body as a way to kind of like shift energy or move energy. Um, if I have a very, like people who are very analytic, I think one of the things that happens, they can't analyze. There's just too much information or the information is not in that language. So it's like, okay, how can I like relax the analytic mind and just be in a place of like, okay, I'm just experiencing it and that's okay. And I think a big one is emotion regulation. Like, oh my God, Realizing what you're feeling as you're feeling it, like oh, I'm feeling my like am I hyperventilating and like my body is shaking and I'm ter oh I'm terrified. Okay, I'm terrified. Is there something I can do about that? Do I need to hug something? Do I need to grab something? And the big one is I think working on can I reach for help? I've had the experience many times. Or I can share, I have one experience where I was really deep inside an ayahuasca experience and I could not, I had to go through the experience, the, the lesson of learn how to ask for help. Or more accurately, here's why you don't ask for help. And I was shown, <laughs> I literally saw this movie, I was like, in five minutes, you're going to crawl on all fours to ask for help. And five minutes later, I find myself crawling on all fours, reaching for the helper in that circle and be like, I really need your help. And it was such a humbling experience. I was like, wow, I have this, I really have learned so much about this thing about how I want to do this alone. That in my, my most intense moments, I retract inside as opposed to like, wait, no, let me open up. Let me tell you that I'm struggling. Let me tell you, let me be able also to take someone else in and receive something that I probably haven't received enough when I, you know, since I was a child. So all just, I really work on that with people. I'm like, how are you with asking for help? And usually for most people, they start with, oh, I'm totally fine. And the moment you start kind of like asking a little bit more, it's all these stories of like, actually, I'm not that good at it. And then there's a story that comes out. When I was asking for help, people rejected me shamed me, humiliated me, embarrassed me, didn't notice me. Um, so then I, I just see that as one of the biggest navigation tools. It's okay to ask for help. Because when you ask for, it's not just about asking for help from a person, it's asking help from the plant, right? If this is a relational process, you can also ask for help from the plant. And I think the idea of asking for help is about actually being open. It's opening yourself. I'm going to pause here, Diana, you want to? Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, I can jump in. I guess, yeah, there's a, a billion things you could say about the actual experience and what that looks like, and it's going to look different every time. I guess that's a big takeaway for me. Every diet, every ceremony is different. Um, one thing that has always really stuck with me, which is exactly what Ido was just talking about in terms of opening, um, 
I know this term surrender gets thrown around a lot in these in these fields and I think for a lot of people that's a really scary word to surrender and I, I personally actually it never really resonated with me and I, I get it intellectually but um, we heard we had Romulo uh, who you've also interviewed uh, Jose Shipibo Maestro um, we had him come in and speak to this group of professionals that we've been working with and you talked about that the work is really about opening um, that that is that's the key and so I think for me I, I'd rather replace the word surrender with opening um, because I think that that's more active and I think it also has a sense of um, empowerment involved in it I think surrender for a lot of people is, is can be kind of a disempowered stance and so I, I guess that's the key it's like what what's the what's the capacity I have to open what parts can I open what parts are safe to open sometimes the plants are going to come in and open a lot really fast and that may be really overwhelming and you may not be able to find any of those tools that you've wanted to or even know where where you are or where your light is or who is what's going on you may have no concept of reality um, and i think that that's why it's also important to have uh, people holding the space as well um, so that they have some sense of okay i know that this person will get through it i know that there's a different side to this story and so i think that it's about like the container is really important when we talk about the ceremonial context or the experience context if that's even just one-to-one -one. um and then it, i think it's like okay how can i start to open so if i'm feeling this terror or i'm feeling this deep shame or if i'm feeling um one with the universe like how can i open myself to that a little bit more like where is it safe to open that um and so that i think it could be like a very active kind of practice and once again someone might not have any concept of that while they're in it and that's okay um but i think that to me has really really kind of encapsulates the work and when is it okay to take a break? So in somatic experiencing, they talk about this idea of titration, which um, is just to do like a little bit at a time. So sometimes, yeah, maybe you need to come out and maybe you need to be like, okay, I'm here. <laughs> this is what's happening. I'm gonna take a moment of like, I'm gonna open my eyes. I'm gonna take a breath. I'm gonna, you know, try and find my center again. I remember with a lot of people that, would be what I'd try and guide them towards if they're having those like completely gone ceremonies where they don't feel, they don't have no idea what's going on. They don't feel connected. It was like, okay, well, how can you try and find your center? Where is that right now? What part of you can access that? And, you know, Ida, when you were talking, I was hearing a lot of what you're saying about, yeah, where's that witness that's also there? Sometimes it's really important to let that witness go away for a while, but sometimes that witness can be really helpful. And sometimes you won't be able to access it as well. So um, I guess it's just a whole spectrum, but that's, you know, I, I guess I see a lot of plant medicines um, processing more of these implicit memories. So these old kind of memories that get stuck in the body. And so that can be kind of in this sensation level and these feelings level. Um, and so I think as much as we can try and just to let that happen, um, the better. And then that's also going to push up against people's edges. And so also to know when it's okay to take a break or um, to breathe or to, you know, ask for some help or comfort um, because those things even talking with a lot of the maestros when I was in Peru, they would say, you know, the visions, sometimes I think the visions can be important. And sometimes they would say, well, it's like a, a TV. <laughs> it's about a lot of, and they would say Westerners, they want to come and they want to see things. Like that's a really important part for the Westerners, but for them, that wasn't the most important element. And so it was about how to the, let the visions kind of be there for people to focus on or to see, but, the deeper work is happening kind of 
in what's to let, they would say to let the plants do what they needed to do or to do the work that they needed to do. So I think it's happening on a lot of levels that we don't really have the language for in English, I would say. So again, this is where I think we could learn a lot from the, the cultures that these medicines come from because there's a whole vocabulary that I don't think we have the tools or the, the understanding or the translation. Uh, there's no direct translations, I think, for a lot of these, these terms of what the, these medicines are doing on both the emotions, the body, um, the mind, and the spirit. So, yeah, that's that's what comes up for me in terms of the the actual ceremony element. I don't know, Jason. I always want to invite you to also speak on these. I know you're often, but I don't know if you want to say anything about that because you run diets and and ceremonies for folks. I think you both have, uh, yeah, encapsulated it beautifully. Um, I mean, something that was coming up for me when you were you were both speaking was, and I don't know if it was intentional, but there was actually something quite sacred to the, the way you were speaking. I think often when someone speaks from their own experience, there's 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 something that, that deeply resonates about that. And and you both were alluding to in the beginning, kind of this idea that in a lot of our cultures, we, we've lost something. We, we've lost that sense of connection. We've lost that sense of, of purpose of something greater than ourselves that, that everything can be reduced, can be purchased. It can be understood with the mind. And, and if we can just grasp it, then we'll be happy. And yet that doesn't seem to be necessarily where things are leading to. And, it, you know, Ido, you use this word suffering, which is really interesting because it's it's a very old word and it's often related to, to these ideas of, of Buddhism and, and this idea that suffering is, is inherent. And so maybe, I, <laughs> I know you asked me my thoughts, but now I'm actually going <laughs> to put it back to you because what's on my mind now is kind of that balance between it seems like we're in this really interesting time where in a way we're rediscovering these things. And it seems like what you were both pointing towards is there's a really deep need for these things right now. And yet it, at the same time, sorry, we were talking about this in the beginning. I have a big wad of Monbe in my mouth and <laughs> I keep getting choked on it. But at the same time, these are ancient techniques. There, there's something that have been around who knows, potentially since time immemorial. And they seem to be a very fundamental part of the human experience. And it, so even this idea of like, that suffering is inherent to being a human, that it's just, it's part of who we are, that we all suffer in some way. And, and you know, at the root, this kind of more existential suffering, the sense of like, who am I? Like, what is all of this? <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes it's fascinating. I, I often think like if, if, if an alien came down and had never seen this world, it would be a psychedelic experience. I mean, just the, the, the sensory perception, the colors, the sounds, the, all of the things going on, the nuance, the ups, the downs, the left and right. And yet these things seem to be a fundamental part of, of the origin and nature of humanity. So... I'm not sure how to phrase the question exactly, but where do you think, where do you think is that that balance and and in that way of like rediscovering this sense of who we are? Because it seems like something, as you were both alluding to, we become very disconnected to, and so this is in in a way, it's not a new technology. It's actually something we're we're going back to that's that's potentially at the root of of you know, as you were saying, Diana, of, of all indigenous people from all around the world, which is who we all are, <laughs> you know, at our root, we're all human beings. So I know that's kind of a convoluted question, but maybe if anything comes up in that, that, that you can speak to. Oh, I love, I love that, Jason. It's, I mean, listening to you, it's coming, all right. I, I think of this practices as the practices of returning 
to some sense of wholeness. And I separate the word return. So there is an act, it's an active, it's an action. You have to really, like, really turn yourself towards connection, towards finding the disconnect and then making the connection, towards seeing that, you know, suffering, right, is inherent. And, but there's also another side, right? Suffering, there is, we're, we're always like balancing opposites in some way, right? I'm, uh, I talk about it from like a Jungian perspective. He talks about tension of opposites. We're always like these opposites colliding. And, but we live in such an, in an environment, in a culture that's very, it's opposite phobic. We don't want to touch suffering, so we escape into something else. But if I escape into something else, I'm not really experiencing goodness. I'm experiencing another reach, an attempt to reach for something that's just going to stop me from experiencing suffering. It's not going to actually make me feel happy. It's not going to actually make me feel connected. It's not going to actually make me feel fulfilled. It's just going to make me feel less of that. So when you say that, I'm like, yeah, there is, right? This practices help us really bring these things together. It helps us really bring these opposites together. And, you know, something Deanna and I talk a lot about, <clears throat> and I really love emphasizing is <clears throat> people throw around this idea of shadow, right? This, you know, you do psychedelics, you do anti-genetics, it's like shadow work. You go and do all this, like, it's a big, scary word that's like mainstream psychology is really butchered. What people don't know is that there is also a thing called golden shadow. So when you go and have these experiences, if you're able to traverse the, the sometimes, for some people, they just get the ecstasy. And that's beautiful. And I envy them. And for some people, you have to traverse the suffering. And then all of a sudden, right, you figure out like, wait, I've, my, my beauty is also in singing. My beauty is that I'm a deeply empathic person. Now I can see, like, I experience my trauma and I see that there's an artist inside of me. That I'm, or like, if we don't even, that I am enough, that I am beautiful, that I am worthy. Right? So it can be anything from people coming out and, like, <clears throat> and I'm sure both of you heard stories of people who are like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be a healer or I'm supposed to become this or I have this innate potential inside of me and for the first time in who knows how many years forever they get in touch with that and it's only because we're able to touch the opposite or actually i think that's maybe we can talk that's where the integration is really really helpful right because where there is the wounded part of you that other side of the wound is always there but if I'm like, because I was raised to look just in that one direction or I lived, you know, occupied by the, 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 the energy and, and oppression of the wound for so long, I wouldn't know that there is something else. So I would just want to get rid of it as opposed to get in touch with that suffering and see that suffering is something caused me to suffer. Yes, existential suffering is true. And for most of us, you know, we're... Things happen to us that cause that suffering, that cause that disconnect. So how do we, right? So part of this, and I, I love what you said, if these practices have been here from the beginning of time, such as suffering, maybe there is a reason why those plants, that somehow humans discovered these plants, right? How did the, like the indigenous people in the Amazon figured out two plants out of what? 80, 90, 100,000 types of plants even more. How do they figure out those two plants that create this specific thing that helps with suffering, that helps with connection? Every indigenous tribe in the world had plants in them. From Africa to the Middle East, to Asia, to South America, to the Americas, they were always plants, right? So if those are the, the is there a way in which they were the, the, the original doctors? Or, or one, right, one, the, one ward in the, in the cosmic hospital, they are like this, this specific ward of healing. That is because, yeah, we need support. So I really want to advocate for like, yeah, there's 
part of our job, or I think part of the integration work, is to really learn how to work with opposites. So we don't get back to the attachment, we kind of want to go Buddhist, and we don't get back to the attachment that leads to suffering. And we see, we just talked about it. One of the things that people, I think one of the first challenges is, oh my God, I came back from this experience, and now I'm back home. That's a tension of opposites. I have this whole thing that's new, but I'm coming back to this whole thing that's old. And for most of us, it's like, how does that even gonna work for me? Because once I came off that sparkle period, it's like, wait, now I have to, I have this whole rich, deep experience of newness, but how does it fit with myself as a partner, with myself as an employee or an employer? with myself as a member of a community, with myself as a part of a family, even with myself, with, between me and myself. If I was a selfish person and I realized why I was so selfish and I want to work on that, how do I, how do I start that work even when everybody knows me as this version of me? Or a better example is if, I, if I'm a people pleaser, right, a caretaker, and all of a sudden, I realized really the trauma, the dynamics, why that happened. And now I'm like, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to take care of me. I'm going to celebrate me. There's a conflict there. People are going to be like, wait, wait, wait. Jason, we know you as this one thing. What happened? I've heard so many people like shame other people's experience. Like, oh, you went to the jungle and you lost it or you become spiritual or whatever, right? Whatever attempt they're gonna to try to create, make you be the thing that you used to be. So yeah, how do we think about it as a play, a play of these different parts of ourselves? And what is our role, right? How do we, the psychedelic community and facilitators and people who are interested in this, how do we think about, okay, what is the way in which we help people like really negotiate those opposites, negotiate those units, the new appeal? Yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> Is there anything you'd like to, to add, Diana? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, a lot in there. <laughs> I, I guess this is one thing I actually appreciate about the third wave therapies that are kind of happening is a lot of them integrate this idea of acceptance of what is that comes from a lot of um, different Buddhist traditions. And so I think that, that that to me, it's just like a relief because it's like, okay, you're not trying to guarantee someone that this life isn't hard. And I think that's the narrative that a lot of us have been sold that you can get the American dream and that everything's gonna be great and you're gonna be happy and that we should celebrate this like very narrow and non-realistic narrative. Um, and there's gonna be, I, I guess it's just like, I, I find, what I have learned from plant medicines has been that they give you tools to navigate those difficulties that happen. And they provide more space in your being to work through it, to move through it. Um, because life, life happens and it's way beyond anyone's control of what's going to happen. And it, I think it's really, you know, a practice of how do you be with what, what is happening and then not to lose sight of what you want and how you want that to look. So I think that kind of, that tension is very healthy and very, very normal. And so also how to like keep that alive within our own psyches of how do I, okay, this is where I'm at. And how do I learn to like accept that? And then this is also like what I want to be cultivating. This is my intention for, you know, moving through life. And I think, um, that idea of intention can be a really beautiful, I mean, most, most people talk about it in the prep stage and the, the kind of experience stage, but I also think it can be really helpful for the integration phase uh, in terms of like, what's the intention? What am I trying to kind of cultivate? Um, what are my values? Like really simple questions like this, how do I live from that place? And I guess one thing I often see in this kind of collision of these, kind of an experience and integration um, is that people also like they, they want to kind of hang on to and so again this theme of attachment they really want to hang on to that experience and they want it to be kind of they kind of get into this idea of like black and white thinking like 
I have to be all of that person who I was in the jungle. And I can't be this person that I am in my day to day, nine to five, um, living the, this style of life. And so I, I guess I also really encourage people to think of it as like an incremental process for folks. And, um, and I think that, you know, going back to kind of your initial inquiry, Jason, into this, this kind of tangent that we're on, it was around that we, yeah, we, we used to have a lot more integrated cultures that I think would support this and that would nurture our gifts. And we could see that, you know, everyone has a different way of learning a different way of processing has different things to offer and would kind of, you know, I remember a story from Seashell Nation, which is the nation closest to where I live, um, that they would say that that was the, the role of the elders in the community was to see the gifts in the children and to help really encourage that basically as they grow. And so I, I guess there's just a lot missing along the way in terms of we don't have, we're not taught how to process. I think that's also like processing suffering was something that people would do in rituals. And so they would have rituals to process those more difficult things. They would have a way to kind of acknowledge collectively things that have happened. Um, because, I, you know, even just I'm thinking of COVID, like it's still in Canada, it's still really impacting like how we're living. Um, we haven't really found a way. There's been a, a tremendous amount of grief for people that have come up in terms of a loss of of the lives that we're living or what it means to be again restricted, the things that have been coming up for people. Uh, a lot of folks have, have entered some pretty dark phases throughout this, this pandemic. Um, and it's like that we don't have a way to, to acknowledge that. We don't have a way to process that. And so I, I guess um, there's a lot of different themes here, but yeah, it's about this kind of suffering and how do we do that and how do we do work with that how do we accept that how do we process that collectively uh, because we've we've lost a lot of those tools we've lost a lot of those those ways of kind of teaching us how to be human you know school doesn't really teach us about that it teaches us skills of mathematics and english and once again it's a very you know, hopefully this is shifting more and more, but it's very much rote learning, which is like the most basic form of learning. Like how can you memorize a thing and spill it back? And so it's not even sometimes like, how do you critically think about this? It's like, how do you, how can you absorb information and regurg regurgitate it, which um, is not the way that everyone learns and is not the way that everyone is, is kind of wired. Um, if you just think of like neurodivergence, it's like people's brains work differently. And I think that that used to have like a specific way or people, they would have a way to kind of integrate that. And instead, I think there's um, a lot of folks that are just kind of pushed out because they don't fit this very narrow kind of narrative or way of functioning. And that can cause a lot of like disease in their in their systems. So, um, yeah, I think I'll maybe I'll just pause there for now. <laughs> there's there's a lot of it, themes here, though. Yeah. Yeah, you said something important. I'm actually curious, Jason, for your perspective too. You know about yeah, and what you brought up about people feeling this pressure to become everything that they saw in their experiences. And you know, there is a beautiful article by. Jacques Mabit, who has that uh, addiction center in Takiwati uh, in Peru. And he talks, you know, from 30 years of experience doing this hybrid kind of work of really doing these, these profound, right, bringing these indigenous work into Westerners who have addiction. And he talks about the loss of the, in the West because we're so disconnected from the spiritual, from the creative, from the symbolic, we literalize things very, very fast. And we, that he's advocating, and I'm with him, that we, we, he's advocating, we need to learn the mythopoetic, like symbolism, like language again, which is, you know, there is a limit to words, but I think in the words of, you know, in the spaces of plants, of the psychedelic, 
you really need more of that kind of language. Because sometimes we, I think people underestimate how tricky the psyche is. I think sometimes we go through experiences in these spaces and they're just our own narcissism. We come back, a lot of people come back really inflated, really grandiose, and they don't see that in their grandiosity, they start eliminating all these things without taking a moment to think about it. Like you said, you don't, have, you don't have to become this one thing all of a sudden and reject everything that you were. Sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes it's definitely necessary. But I think there's a lot of, in my mind, there's a lot of mindfulness. There's a lot of thinking or a lot of reflection, not thinking, that should come in the process to be like, wait. I mean, I know multiple people who came out of the jungle and they're like, oh my God, I'm supposed to be a shaman. I'm going to open a retreat center. All of them fell on their faces. All of them ended up actually throwing themselves into a much more complexity, something that actually ended up traumatizing them. Or people who came back and they're, what I call, they want to hit the, the atomic reset button. Right? They're like, oh my God, I lived my life in such a this way and that way and that. Let me burn everything down to the ground. As opposed to, wait, if I take some, first let me take some time, right? Then Graf said, don't do anything in these 72 hours after your experience, right? And let that kind of come down, right? If I take some time and start doing the integration work, if that insight is true, it's going to stay. If I need to hit that reset button, it's going to be there. So I don't know where you two are, are at about that, but I think that that feels like a really important piece as far as because of because of the the contradiction of those spaces and the spaces we come back to, you know. So I think those sometimes those things can actually are are some attempt of self care that just really goes sideways or gets literalized. You, you both mentioned a, a really interesting idea about language and, and how language is so powerful and, and how it literally shapes our world. And I was reminded in one of the episodes I interviewed my friend Brian and he was speaking about the Shpibo word for how it's often translated would be good day. Uh, hakun nata. But those two words actually, hakun means, and sorry, Brian, if I'm getting this wrong, um, <laughs> But hakun means, it, it actually means good. So that's where good day comes from. But on a deeper level, it, it means that which is true or that which serves nature, that which is life-giving, is truth, is goodness. And natu is translated as day, but really it means world. And in a deeper level, it means universe. And in a deeper level, it means this ever eternal present moment, that which is. And that always just fascinates me so much about language. I mean, if we really lived our lives where when I greeted you, <laughs> I said, hey, Ido, <laughs> this ever eternal present moment is life-giving. <laughs> I would like you so much, Jason. I would like, <laughs> appreciate you so much. <laughs> but that really shapes our reality. and. I remember uh, someone else I interviewed, Claude, uh, who's a, a good friend and a, a very wise guy. But I remember early when I came to the temple, because we were speaking about this idea of integration, and I was kind of questioning, like, is it really that important? I mean, it, it seems like maybe something we're creating more, you know, kind of this this new thing that now we have to focus on. And he said, it, you know, for, for like the Shipibo, like integration is just part of their lives. Like when you go to ceremony, you're with that cordandero or he's, he's a few doors down from you, like for your whole life. <laughs> if you're struggling, you're like, hey man, like I'm struggling. Like, can you help me? Or like, what's going on? Like, I don't understand what the hell happened. And so it's, it's very much part of our lives. So kind of with that idea of language, <clears throat> because it's language is it for us. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very much a worldview. And so when you're speaking about that idea of integration, I, I think it is very important. And something you said, Diana, which is, is really beautiful, which for me very much resonates is, you know, people often ask, like, what, 
what are these plant medicines? What are they doing? And, and I think something you said is, is, is very, very profound, which is it's making us more human. And that, that doesn't seem so sexy sometimes, <laughs> you know, speaking <laughs> to God or aliens or purging your brains out, you know, that, that's, that's more sexy, but to be human, it, it seems something just very common and it is very common. And something you were pointing towards, Ido, that this idea of like extremes and it's, again, it's this language, like even this Buddhist language, which has been spoken about forever is like, what is the middle way? What is the balance? And I think so many people in, on an intellectual level, they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. You know, but even, you know, it's something I see a lot is even with these very powerful plant medicine experiences, as I think you were pointing to, you know, is we can have this experience, but instead of making us maybe more human or coming back to center, it's like, then we attach onto this and, and that then becomes our personality. And it, I mean, you can see it in all aspects of life. So what's happening politically, what's happening interpersonally, it's very hard to find that center and, and to be really embodied in that human process. So maybe both of you, if you can speak again to that idea of, of integration and you both mentioned like this idea of tools and what are, what are things that, that, that you found that can be beneficial when someone goes down to, to a, often a very foreign culture, a very different worldview, a very different language, they have this experience which is often very profound in, in a way that's, you know, as you were saying, Diana, very unique to that person, which almost always is something they never would have expected, <laughs> but it was what in the end they needed, whether they understand it in that moment or not, something shifted, something happened. So what are, what are things that you've seen that help people to, to kind of take that and, and that's, I guess, kind of, as we were talking about that archetype, that stage two, the, the experience, and, and then moving into stage three, which is like, okay, now, now I'm back. <laughs> what do I do? Who am I? What, what is going on? <laughs> so there is this very simple equation. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, I'm going to advocate uh, there is inter integration is that there is integration that's a lifestyle and then there is integration as well. And those are two very different things. I think integration is, is the way I understand it, is the way I've experienced it, is the way I see it with people that I work, is the way I research. It's really a way of, um, you brought Buddhism in the middle path. It's really a way of being. It's a way of deciding like this is, I'm going to relate to my experience in a certain way. So I'm going to look at it, I'm going to observe it, I'm going to check it, I'm going to feel it in my body, I'm going to sense it in my body, I'm going to feel it in my heart, I'm going to see how my spirit reacts to it. Um, as opposed to, well, let me just journal a little bit, which is a great integration tool, by the way. Or let me just do, oh, you know, like, <clears throat> let me just change my diet, let me just do an act. So for me, that's more implementation. That's the thing that comes from your integration process. So there's integration and implementation. So there are tools, there are tools like, you know, go talk to people like Diana or myself, people who are like, have done this work and, you know, help people facilitate these transitions. Communities, integration circles, I think that's a huge one. Being in a group of people who speak your language, who went through similar experiences, who make you feel not alone, to make you feel somewhat understood a lot of the times from the groups we we do and i think diana you agree with me um people say like i had all this shame attached to this and now i'm coming i'm listening to other people and i wow it's so freeing i'm not crazy there's nothing uniquely wrong with me we're all going through this human struggle and that's so profound for me. I think that's like such a profound thing because that allows you to start digesting and assimilating your experience on another level. Because you don't, you take away that shame rejection of like, well, there's, it's too much. You know, I'm uniquely, uniquely traumatized, uniquely messed up. Um, 
sometimes integration would be, you know, and I wish, and you brought it, Jason. If we lived in the village, then the shaman who lives three doors down the road will maybe tell you, hey, maybe you need to drink this plant too. Or you need to, like Deanna said, maybe you need to go be of service, or maybe you need to go be, put your hands in the dirt, or a combination of those things. Because, you know, your integration opens up something. That's the thing. The experience is just the, it's the entrance to the door. I think for me, the integration is really where things really start opening up. Like the lesson, I, integration is a lifestyle for me is you keep opening that space. You keep opening that space. All right, so we're back to where we started, which is about opening. You don't try to find, sometimes, yes, there will be exclamation marks. Like, okay, I need to change my diet really important i need to go i need to start a meditation practice i need to go fix these relationships because they're causing me suffering because i'm not in authentic in authenticity in them in integrity i'm hurting people people are hurting me so sometimes it's very clear like that but even when you do that it's going to keep opening up right so now it's like okay how do i show up differently to these two different relationships and do I have spaces where I can continuously talk and express and experience this change that's happening in me? So I would, yeah, I guess I'm advocating for both integration as a as an ongoing process and an ongoing attitude. That's the word I was looking for. It's an attitude towards your experience. It's a relation, a relational attitude towards your experience. And then there is integration and implementation. And they work together. They go like this. You know, it's like what Diana you said about. Gabor referencing, and that's actually something you said. You said any integration process has two components, your brain and your creativity. Your brain, your thinking, your thinking self and your creativity. You can only reflect a certain place. Then it has to become nonverbal. Go paint, go dance, go be in nature. Go talk to your invisible friend. Go talk to the plants. Go talk to God. Go talk to the architect. And they always work like this. You have to do it. That's that's the full integration process, as I understand. And eventually, something new emerges, something new bursts. As opposed to what both you and Jason and Yana brought, like how we can be torn into one direction or the other because of suffering, because of hardship, because we're being like torn from inside as part of our integration process. Right? There is a disintegration that needs to happen. Yeah, yeah, great. Um, yeah, I guess I don't think I need to speak more. I, I just echo and agree with this kind of attitude, which I think ultimately is some kind of, if you don't want to use this word spiritual, but some kind of spiritual practice of being in the world. I think eventually this stuff kind of leads you in that direction, whatever you want to call it. Um, but yeah, I, I guess the the tools element of it, maybe I'll just say a little bit more about that part. Um, I think it's ultimately just ways to be with, once again, what's coming up. So um, a lot of folks need to learn tools in terms of how to be with their feelings, how to be with their sensations, how to be with their thoughts how to not just let them unconsciously kind of run the show. So maybe they're feeling really anxious and they're not really acknowledging it. And that's causing them to speak in this way, to act in this way, to make certain choices in their life this way. And so I think it's about kind of, once again, bringing this awareness back into, well, well what's happening and kind of really slowing it down. Um, and then giving people different things they can do. Maybe you can breathe, maybe you can call a friend, maybe you can go for a walk, maybe you can pray with your pipe, maybe you can, um, maybe you need to scream, maybe you need to bite a pillow, maybe you need to like punch something, um, you know? And, and so I guess it's just a, a ways to channel these different parts of yourself. So I, I, I find, um, so from young, it's some, it's subpersonalities. Uh, IFS is probably the sexier, more current one, internal family systems. Um, but this idea of that there's different parts of us that have different needs, and then it's kind of like, how do we tend to them? And, 
and kind of give them attention. So I guess that's kind of what the tools speak to in my mind is like how to give people tools to regulate themselves and kind of come back to themselves. And then also to express these different elements. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of, I would say, I work with men and women and some people that are non-binary, um, but I'd say specifically within the, a lot of the women that I work with, like helping them to find anger has been like a really big piece. It's been a big piece of my own work and it's also been a big piece of my work with clients or, you know, just like helping them to express it. And sometimes even the shutdown that happens with the thought of expressing anger even if I'm just trying to do a somatic exercise of like squeezing it into a towel or a blanket, um, just like something comes online and says it's not safe and starts that shutdown. So even just like, I, I guess I find those tools of like how to like open that door so slightly, it's like it might be really small at first. And then so that these different elements that are, are part of being healthy can can show up and can be part of them too. And so I think it's a, like a broadening of, of their, their personality in a way. Um, I would say that that's kind of what the tools can, can give us access to. And then I think the attitude that Ido was speaking to is really about like, how do I, yeah, how do I stay curious? And it doesn't have to be all day, every day. It doesn't mean that it's not okay to do things where you're like, I want to watch a show and that's great. <laughs> like, I, I think it's just about like, okay, how do I have these moments of just kind of checking in with myself or coming back um, and making sure that I'm aligned with my values and what's important to me. I wanna, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to riff on what Deanna said you know, something that Deanna and I have talked a lot about in the last year and a half is we kept hearing that people are talking in those archetypes, in those parts, without knowing that they're talking about that. And the moment we started putting, like, giving people some kind of frame, it was incredibly helpful because I think people then find they have something they can touch, they can relate to as opposed to just this overwhelming big thing, right? So like famous ones are the inner child that comes up, right? Or the, the, the father or the mother or, um, uh, yeah, ego death is a big one that people like to throw around in psychedelic community. And, um, and once you help, right, once you can work with people about, okay, so like, let's say I'm going to take Deanna's experience of the anger, like most women that I work with, that's a wound that's not just a, that specific woman, it's something that has been inherited in, in, in the feminine for, for eons. For a woman to be angry is right something that patriarchy has needed to kill for a long, long time. So if you start framing that as that, and it's not just about you, there is this intergenerational time link that, was like, that is also related to you. And when, when in your life, right, when did, when did that girl learn that she shouldn't be? Right, so starting to really frame to move from not just having big experiences, but starting to put all these like concepts and frames that help people like find themselves or help like find that part in themselves, I think has been, at least from what we've seen, has really helped people both embody it better and start to relate to it better. And then the moment you can embody it and relate to it better, you can actually start working with it. So now it's like, wait, I can feel that that screen that came that doesn't allow me to even squeeze a towel. Well, who's that? Well, that's my father. Or that's, you know, that's um, misogyny or that's patriarchy. Okay, now we know who we're talking with. So we moved from, oh, there's something wrong with me and I'm blocked to no, there's this force that's acting inside of me that now I can dialogue with to start doing that liberation integration process. So just wanted to kind of like emphasize that because I think that's a lot of people who come back from these experiences are really dealing with that, with all these loose parts that are flying around and they think it's this, this is who I am. It's like, no, it's just one aspect of you. 
and it revolves right you even if ifs schwartz took that from you he took all of that from you he just made it into a much a digestible like version of it which is fantastic right but the thing that they both share is like all these satellite parts of you are circling the core and that core is your capital s self that is your psycho spiritual self that is so profound so so full of essence so full of your true authenticity of creativity of the healing capacity right maps work on trying to find the healer healer that's in there so the moment you realize that you have that core and these satellites are relating to that core something happens i feel there is like opportunity there's hope that can come up or opportunity or potential that can be really that can, people can tap into yeah, it's, it's one of the fascinating things, and it seems like something we've, as you were mentioning, we, we've lost a lot in culture, which is this idea of archetype or story or myth, and even these, these children's tales, which used to be told all the time, and, uh, you know, it's only as I've gotten older that I've really seen the power in those, and like what they were trying to teach children was, was these seemingly complex ideas, but that were in very simple terms. I mean, I was thinking the other day of, of like the story of the, the three piglets and, you know, the, the one builds his house from a straw and the wind blows it down. The other builds it from wood and eventually, I don't know, the fire comes and takes it. And, you know, the, the one, he builds it from stone, but, but it takes him so long and the others are laughing at him like, you know, uh, you're, you're wasting your time. And, and yet that's the house that stood. And, and it, there's, I mean, it seems so simple and yet there's, there's such power in that. There's such knowledge and wisdom in that. And, and even in the Amazon, they, they have these tales and it's a fascinating thing because I think a lot of times, a lot of this work is dismissed like in the Amazon, or I think even like from European roots when talking about things like fairies and, and yet that line between what we consider reality and things that can be felt or sensed, there's a tremendous teaching and value in that. And that line is very fine. And it's, it's often when, when we only see the world through this lens of like what I can see and touch and feel in this moment, we lose out on so many things. We lose out on the symbolism and we, we, we lose out on the myth and what those things are actually alluding to, which can also help us in this reality. Um, it's something you were, you're both speaking of. And, and I think, you know, this is one of the interesting things of, of this idea about suffering. And it's something I've seen a lot in my work is this idea of disconnect. And, and I think Diana used the word of like, these plants are opening us to something greater. Um, Ido used the word God, the word spirit was used. And I think these words have become a bit dirty in a way <laughs> in a lot of our cultures, because it's seen as something very primitive. You know, we look at it as if it's uneducated, it's, it's mythical, it's, it's fantastical, it's... And it, it. It, yeah. And if my mind can't experience it, then it's not real. It's not true. And, but it seems like something you're both alluding to is the, kind of this idea of something you know, sacred or spiritual that these plants have an ability to open us to, which is actually very healing for us. And, and it, it, it enables us to reconnect in a way. And yet it seems like something so many people, like we don't want to kind of acknowledge or to talk about because it's seen as if it's again fantastical or we're uneducated so is that something maybe you can speak to about this kind of this sacredness because you know again as we were talking about in, in almost all of these cultures these 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 rites these rituals there was something very special about them it wasn't just something like oh you know Ido Diana let's go let's go drink ayahuasca tonight it'll be a good time there was this preparation, there was this intention, there was this dedication, there was restriction, there was isolation. You know, I mean, even Moshe Pibo, 
when you talk to them now, they're like, we don't want to do that because it's too tough. <laughs> I actually just interviewed uh, Diana knows them. It's a family, uh, Ines, Laura, and Lila. You know, mm -hmm. and that's one of their big worries is that they say people don't want to do that anymore because it's just too tough. But she also brought up this really interesting point around the pandemic and COVID. You know, she was saying all of these like seemingly religious people who talk about God and faith, when the pandemic hit, she said they were going crazy, like they lost their faith, they lost their trust. And she was saying, you know, we have faith too. And before the pandemic, we had faith. During the pandemic, we had faith and we still have faith because our faith is actually rooted in something that we've experienced, something that's real for us. So I know, again, that's maybe kind of a long <laughs> convoluted question, but if that's something you can uh, speak to. And I know we're also getting uh, probably a bit uh, towards the end of we our can, time. We can, so. no, you, you're, you're opening something important. We can. <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I think a lot about this. Because, I mean, personally, I have intense curiosity about it and a lot of grief. Because I think for most people, when they hear words like God or divinity, it actually touches some religious wound that they have. And they're just not aware of how deep that wound is or it's still so raw. Or, and in, I think the grief for me, it's like, well, if you emancipated yourself from, you know, work with that, that wound or the impact of the wound, you will get to experience sacredness in your own version of sacred, not the way you told it should be, not the way you were told that there is either you were indoctrinated into there is this, you know, old white dude sitting in the sky and it's going to like your version of sacred, but because it's still like you're not emancipated and you haven't, then you don't get to experience any of it or you get to let like, let just this tiny bit in. And that's sad. That is very sad. And so many people like, and yeah, and I think that's part of what the beauty of this plants are is that they open us to our own version of spirituality. And some people find it all of a sudden in nature. They want to go hang out with the plants. Because that's where they feel something that is transpersonal, beyond words. And some people find it in practices. I know people who found it in writing. They find that when they sit and write, all of a sudden they connect with something that is something inside of them emerges that is beyond their ego, beyond themselves. Or all of, I mean, for me, a lot of I, you know, I my trajectory was going through through Eastern traditions. I went through Eastern traditions, went to India and Nepal and all this, and then slowly I what I call is I descended into my humanity. I wanted to be a kite. It was fun. It was fun being like high, like way up in there, the spiritual world. And it was necessary. I learned a lot. But the more I learned, the more I was like, oh no, the work is, is being embodied. It's embodied spirituality. It's embodied human, humanity. And all of a sudden for me, it was like, oh, I can feel God in a moment, in a person, in an interaction with a person. I feel this thing that I'm like, this is the essence. And it's really, I mean, what you're saying about them saying of how hard it is, that's, it is, it's hard, it's hard work. To be, my, my ayahuasca teacher said, she would say, this work is not about being more spiritual, it's about being more human. And I remember in the beginning, I was like, I don't know about this. This is not, this is not, this doesn't sound sexy, right? This doesn't sound like fun. I already know what it means to be human usually mostly about suffering i'm from israel like it's about wars and death and then conflict and beauty and celebration but it's not i want more and the more i was in this practice i was like oh now i get it to be fully human is to be with your heart wide open to have your spirit participate all the time in my mind and then whatever it is that you find spiritual starts speaking to you. And yes, there's a lot of layers sometimes that we have to continue work with. So I, I appreciate you bringing that story, Jason, because I think that communicates, again, this tension, right? So here is people who were talking God and all this, and poof, that's the biggest, and such trauma events lost their connection to faith. 
And then these other women who are like, actually, we have faith. We went through experiences. We have this practice that is really hard, but, but keeps us grounded in faith. So even at, at meeting this challenge, we can boost that part of ourselves. You know, that's why, so, you know, when people come back and they're sparkly, even if they don't say, I met God, or but you see, you see the sparkle, there's a sparkle in their eyes, there's an energy. I really, like, I sometimes emphasize to people, like, can you just be with, feel yourself right now? You look, you're glowing, you're alive. So you have an imprint. That's, for me, that's spiritual enough. You feel this alive, that's a spiritual place to be in. Right? And then we slowly, Ramda said it beautifully. He's like, no matter how many times I tripped, just kept coming back into this. I kept wanting to come out of this. Right? So that's, and here is the, herein lies the conflict. But if we start having this imprint, it's like, like Diana said, it's not how do I chase that, the high. It's how do I understand that that state of being is something that is always available to me. If I continue to, if I change my attitude towards myself, towards my life, towards my relationships, towards the way I live my life. It's very, yeah, the spirituality piece is so, so complex. I guess there's a few things that come up for me. Um, one piece is just that like religion has been such a big source of trauma um, through like a force of colonizing. And I, I don't know if we spoke about this last time, Jason, we might have, but I think it has such a bad taste or it's a bad word in so many, for so many folks because you know, churches have done a lot of harm. <laughs> Um, and I, I think they've done some really beautiful things. And, you know, I grew up in a, in a church and I, I mostly saw it as like a community of a place where people come, uh, but I didn't really, and it, it actually, you know, in some ways it provided a container for me, but there was some part of me that was like, I, I also feel disconnected from this. It didn't feel real. And so I'm guessing that's what like Inez, Laura, Laura and Lila were speaking to. Um, and so yeah, and I, I also feel that once again, this is kind of this longing that I spoke to earlier. That I think there is that longing to belong to something larger. I think that's like a fundamental part of being human. And once again, we've culturally just lost the container, the context in which that can happen for a lot of people. So I think that's what a lot of folks are seeking with this. And then the other thing that came up for me when you were talking about it was I have a three-year-old <laughs> and she lives in this world, you know, like often there's uh, animals that are in the house with us that I don't imagine or I can't connect with, but I mean, I, I play along and I pretend with her, but like, she's just living in that kind of in-between state, like of like reality and, and her imagination, like they're very blended. And it's actually really, like, I feel like that could be a whole series around like what it is to watch a child and how that relates to this process in terms of plant medicine and integration. And what does that mean? Um, but yeah, they're very much like, she's very much between worlds. Like, and I just see how that can slowly start to kind of shut down um, with kids, I guess I'm surrounded by a lot of kids, just having one myself and a lot of families, like that can slowly get shut down. And I, I guess in some ways that's, that's normal for the Western context. And then I think it's also about like, well, how do we carry that curiosity of how to keep some of that alive? Um, and to know that it's also her path and, you know, she's going to have to make her own choices, but kids live in that world, like of there's a unicorn at breakfast this morning and uh, there's a puppy and a cat and a bear and there's, I'm gonna be a monkey right now. And like all of that stuff, this kind of element of play and, and, um, and just like, or even like that presence of getting curious of that spirituality of like last night I was um, at someone else's house who has a, a toddler as well, who's younger and they were just looking at slugs for like a really long time <laughs> and you know and and so I just I, I feel like 
we can learn a lot from kids in terms of, of that that amount of presence and that amount of imagination and then this like this desire to like shut down that reality um, which I think is once again is a very much a cultural thing uh, because that's not irrational I feel like rationality is what rules this this culture and so um, I, I guess I get it why people have um, a pushback towards religion and have a pushback. I think for some people, Christianity like has served them and has kind of served its purpose. I think if it really goes back to that essence of Christ, which was about compassion, like that's, he's a, he was a really beautiful teacher. Um, but for a long time, the church used that in a, in a very different way. And so I think there's a, a huge questioning of that and questioning of, of that Kind of essence and again christian there's a lot of different religions but christianity is kind of the dominant that's the considered the norm within the western in terms of the those standards like you're christian or you're you're not um, and i know that's expanding but but that is kind of one of the main things and it has been a, a tool for oppression in a lot of ways and so i i'm I'm glad there's a questioning of that in some ways. And once again, if it serves people, it serves you. Um, but I'm, yeah, I think there's, there has been a, a disconnect and there has been a like, okay, now we're gonna be more scientific. We're gonna focus on this. It has to be rational. And I think there's a lot that's lost in that. And so I hope that opens up. And, you know, even I've been like watching looking at some of the shows that are available for kids and like, they're all about being rescued. <laughs> like that's the main thing right now. It's like, there's a team. So there might be puppies, they might be cats, they might be a princess, they might be ponies. Uh, but the main storyline that is kind of being told to kids right now is that you have to be rescued, uh, which is really problematic, I think. Um, and it's very hard to find shows that are not about that. And I mean, there's a difference between like supporting and coming together. But the main thing is like, there's a team of people and they will come and rescue you from the trouble you're in. And so I, I think there's, there's a lot of different themes around what narratives are being told and how that kind of shows up in our psyche and our body and our spirit. Um, and then I think to kind of summarize this conversation, like plant medicines are a kind of a tool that I think can open up some space to to look at how we've internalized those different narratives be it around our sexuality around our our race around our you know who we can be who we can't be culturally all of this stuff and so I feel like it's a it's a tool to kind of open up some of these doors and to have that inquiry process and to actually like well what is that kind of capital S self that Ido was talking about like who am I like what's important to me again like these really really simple but difficult questions beautiful well thank you so much um is there anything you you all would like to to close with or to add anything that's in your mind that we haven't addressed that you is itching from the depths of your skin to express before we, <laughs> we close. <laughs> I just want to appreciate you, Jason, for providing this space, I think, uh, for us to come here and, and share our experience. And I think it's important that, you know, this is part of us being part of a bigger community of people who are into this. and. I think it's so important that we keep this dialogue open and show different ways of seeing these experiences and how we can be in them and approach them and relate to them and keep teaching each other, really keep teaching each other and growing and not, yeah, turn exclamation marks into more question marks. Um, so we can keep being curious because that's what keeps the aliveness and that's what keeps us also in integrity, I think to really keep questioning our ways and how we see things and, and learning from each other. So thank you for opening that space and providing that space. Oh, my pleasure. It's, uh, <clears throat> I think it's super important. And as you guys were talking about it, I think that community is, is very important. And uh, that sharing of knowledge, it's, um, 
because a, a lot of this work is kind of for better and for worse uh, rooted in mystery and, and obscurity and that served a purpose but I, I think also there's there's something about really bringing it to, to the light and, and you know big part of the the creation of this was to to speak to people like you you know pe speak to people who've been doing this work and it's it's a much different experience and it's it's something that I think nothing can really train you for other than actually doing it, doing it with yourself and, and working with a lot of people. Because as you said, you, you see these archetypes that come up, you see these patterns and it, you know, this, this work is so mysterious. And yet at the same time, there's something very real about it. There's something very human about it. And, and I think having voices of people who've, who've really gone through that, it's, it's super powerful. And, you know, as you were saying, you know, it's often, often that's, that's just what people need is just like a, it's okay. Like it's, it's okay. Like, and just hearing that is, is tremendously powerful. And, but it's also, it's a much different resonance from someone <laughs> who's, who's really speaking from a place of, of, of knowledge and truth rather than just, oh yeah, it's, it's okay. I hope it's okay. <laughs> Is it okay? <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I think there's, you know, we just, like I, you know, mentioned this, we just wrapped up right before this call, this group. Um, and the beauty of that group was that we had someone who his main path was plant medicines and um, some therapists and nurse. And so it's just like an interdisciplinary group of folks that are curious about this work and curious about asking these questions. And I, I guess the thing that kind of stuck out for me is like there, there's a lot of humility because we don't know a lot of this information and that tension of the mystery and then also trying to ground it um, is alive and well. And there's so many different interpretations and it's not that one is is better uh they're just different and so i, I guess i yeah i appreciate you bringing a lot of different voices to this conversation and, and you know a lot of work goes into doing this and, and sitting and having this conversation so yeah, i appreciate it and i i just i think it's important on so many levels to be having these conversations right now yeah. Well, beautiful. Thank you so much. I, I, I feel like we could uh, talk for another couple hours. So maybe at so, some point in the future, we'll do uh, Ido and Diana part two and, uh, and, uh, and see how that goes. Because uh, I, I think you both have a, a lot of beauty and wisdom to share. And um, I, I think people will get a lot out of this, this episode. If, if people are interested in, in contacting you, with, if they're interested in working with you, maybe can you each talk a little bit about how one can do that, the, the work you do, and, and how people can go about uh, getting in touch with you? Sure, yeah. Sure, um, we can share, I feel like the integration circle is probably the best place for our joint kind of collaboration. Um, my website is Deanna, the letter C Rogers at gmail or at dot com. Sorry, that's my email and my website. <laughs> so much for used to saying my email. So you can email me or reach out to me through my website in terms of individual work. Great. Yeah. So the integration circle um, at the moment, mostly on if you want, you can email us uh, the integration circle at gmail.com or through social media, Facebook or Instagram. And for me personally, you can reach me at um, Do Cohen, so it's my name, dot therapy at gmail.com if you want to contact me directly. Both of those work. Perfect. Well, thank you so much to you both. Uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, thank you for coming on. I, I hope a lot of people uh, watch this and, and hopefully some people reach out to you. And thank you for your time. And uh, I look forward to the, to the next one. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Jason. Take care. 
All right, everybody, that is it. I hope you enjoyed this interview. I really enjoyed uh, sitting down and speaking with Jan and Ido. I, I think they both have a, a lot to share, and I, I hope you all got a lot out of this. Um, hopefully I'll have him back on. I, I think we could do another few hours, maybe have Ido back on as a solo guest also. So I think that's it for today's episode. As always, if you're able to support the podcast, that's a really big help to me. Patreon is a really uh, nice way. It's a subscription service for as little as a dollar a month. You can sign up. Uh, there's different tiers you can sign up for, and it gives you some really nice uh, benefits back. Things like early access to shows, bonus material, Q&A. Um, to all the people who have done that, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. There's also the ability to direct donate via PayPal. I'll put a link to both of those in the show notes. If you're not able to do that, uh, simply subscribing to the show, going in the, the YouTube channel, subscribing, turning on the notification bell, liking the video, that's a really big help in getting the show out to a bigger audience. And then with the audio version going on Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the show and leaving a starred rating and a short review, that's a really big help. To all the people who have done that, thank you very much. Um, so I think that's it. Um, I'm not sure of the following guests because I'm going to be traveling a little bit. Um, but as always, I'll, I'll have some really interesting guests coming on. So thank you all for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this and I will see you all on the next episode. Thank you.